Well, even for somebody uh, protected, uh, you know, working, didn't have to worry about money, uh, it was still awful because you could not shut yourself off from, from what was happening. And uh, just to interview people for a, a nursing job for the baby or a, a cook, you know, I had to have a, a cook and a guy to, to do whatever they do. And they were, it was just awful. The need for a job was so terrible. Um, I don't know what the figures were, but there was one point when one worker in four was out of a job. And there was no backup, you know, no government help to speak of. By 34, would, there might have been just a little bit of works uh, progress, uh, you know, whatever they're called, <laughs> those initials, but they hadn't really um, um, amounted to very much. And uh, a person would be lucky to have two days' work a week on one of the government projects, and that was it. Well, the Depression uh, was awful, even if you were not scared, you know, not scared for yourself, as I was, and I had a job and enough money, but you couldn't escape it. It was everywhere, and, uh, a, you know, a quarter of the people in the country were out of work, and, for instance, it was just murder to interview people for domestic help because their need was so intense. Without a job, it was, it, it was terrible to be poor in this country at that time because there was no dole and no welfare. Um, but to be without a job when you were used to working was especially painful. And you t what somebody like me tended to do was to hire the people that needed it the worst <laughs> instead of the people that were best for it. So I was always in terrible trouble. Anyway, my point is that you didn't escape it, even though in the studio and, and in your, among your friends you tried to, you know, have a good time. That was what life was about, after all. Uh, it crept in everywhere. Inside the studio it was all work and fun. Uh, at that time, their work was fun. Uh, most directors wanted a happy set, and uh, there was still music. For some, some people kept music on the set, a uh, ha hangover from silent times. Of course, the difference was that the music didn't play during the acting, only between, but that was a lot of fun. And people mostly, uh, you know, they told dirty jokes and tried to have a good time. So that was, that was the atmosphere you found inside, pretty much not conscious of the real world, not conscious of what was happening in Europe and, or what was happening, you know, with the farm workers or much of anything. Well, the work itself was fun uh, and interesting and uh, scary uh, sometimes, but, but mostly very exciting. Uh, the publicity and the endless uh, costume, uh, you know, having pins put all in you and you didn't get your lunch hour and the hours were awful, uh, that part of the business was hard, I think. And being so tired was hard because there was no protection. You could work um, 14, 16 hours and then go home and come back and without any particular rest period. And, uh, but mostly it was, um, it was fun and Metro was very proud of being Metro and you got to see all those exciting people and you even got to work with them, you know. So it was exciting for a young contract player. Um, there wasn't very much glamour to being a, a contract player. You worked like crazy all the time. You were either working or doing publicity or, uh, or doing uh, costume changes. And um, it, w it was hard and it wasn't particularly glamorous. And people didn't feel glamorous and they certainly didn't behave as if they were glamorous. The, uh, the people, an awful lot of them came from the theater anyway into movies and the stars and, and the 
important players were darling, almost all of them. They really were. It was not fashionable to be a temperamental that very, very few people behave badly. One reason, because you didn't work very long if you didn't get along with people. No, the thing, uh, it was not like a factory. Uh, it was like, um, oh, I answered you. Well, we'll cut that. Um, being in the studio, there was a lot of, uh, uh, there were politics and there was um, a lot of stuff I didn't understand and I didn't want to know about up there in the big offices. You know, I didn't like any of that because of the feeling that you were so terribly controlled. And uh, uh, I was uh, 20 when I went to Metro. And so they felt, and Mayor in particular, that they knew what was best for me, including whether I should get married and how I should behave. And um, not, not that I was doing anything very interesting, but they felt total control, including uh, my relationship with my family, um, uh, what guys I, sh I should date, and uh, this kind of thing. I found infuriating and uh, I, I hated it. I didn't think it was businesslike, and I still don't think so. But uh, that was that was rough. Uh, there were inter inter politics of the studio. That is, uh, what producers uh, were getting ahead and uh, what cliques uh, were doing well, and so on. But I didn't know about that. Uh, so far as politics, uh, it was pretty Republican on the whole. I think. Uh, there may have been Democrats, but I didn't know about them, if there were. Certainly no radicals. Being a working mother in 1934 was easy in one way. It was very easy to get help, and very good help. Uh, it was expected that a nurse lived with the family. It's true that she got uh, a day off a week and half a day uh, on Sunday. Uh, and you had to have a relief nurse. But, but help was cheap uh, and, and good. That was on the, <laughs> the good side, if you can call it that. At the same time, uh, it was awful because of the hours. And the studio had no respect as long as you were on your feet. You know, they didn't care what shape you were in. And they didn't look out for your health or uh, or any of that, and we worked extraordinarily long hours. There was no guild, you know, at that time. And uh, uh, the cameraman didn't have a union. Um, they, it was just a, a company, a company company, and they did as they damn well pleased. And there were two people on our lot, uh, Garbo and uh, Wallace Berry, who had it in their contract that they went home at five o'clock. Nobody else had any say about when they worked and how long. And uh, anyway, that's one of the reasons we got a guild eventually. Well, my first year at Metro, I made the most. That, that was 11 pictures within a year. Of course, the parts were small, but nevertheless, uh, it kept me mighty busy and I was awful skinny at the end of the year. Oh, well, uh, when the studios got very frightened that they might be taken over by the banks, this was their great fear always, uh, they declared and, you know, agreed among themselves that all of the studios would demand that everybody take a 50% pay cut. And uh, even the producers, in a gracious way, cut their salaries too. Uh, um, a secretary made $18 a week. So for those weeks, I've forgotten how long it lasted, a couple of months, I think, they got $9. And uh, I think I was making a hundred and a quarter, so I got half of that. Well, in, you know, in 32 or three, uh, the studios got panicky because they were sure they were going to be taken over by the banks, they were going to go bankrupt, and it was all going to be terrible. And they got together and decided that everybody would take a 50% pay cut for an unlimited uh, amount of time. We didn't know how long it would happen, but 
We agreed because we didn't have much choice. There were uh, two people that didn't agree, Greta Garbo and Wallace Beery. <laughs> but uh, at, so Metro quick got everybody together and made dinner at eight. We got everybody for half price. <laughs> Uh, well, Mayor, uh, I think Metro was the head of the anti-Upton Sinclair campaign, and uh, I know a, a young director that they had shoot those supposed interviews with the men on the street, except the men on the street were uh, well paid, and they uh, were dressed to look very dirty and messy and drunk and, and uh, awful, you know, and they were the people that were for Upton Sinclair. And uh, the director in, in became quite disillusioned uh, with what was supposed to be the truth, as Metro saw it, and quit. He wouldn't do it after a while. It was, uh, I think any fool looking at it would know it was a fake, but maybe not. And that was run in newsreels all the time. Mayor was... Uh, you know, a benevolent dictator, he thought. And uh, uh, a lot of people found that very irritating. I didn't much like it. Thalberg, of course, was the bright young, um, up and coming everything producer. He's a, a person that had been ill as a kid and read all his life. He was in bed for years and read and read and read and read. And he had a wonderful story mind. Uh, he was not a particularly attractive person, and he was not at all nice to, to actors. Um, but I think that he was very valuable. In the first place, he understood one thing, which uh, everybody at Metro agreed, that movies were made for women. That was the audience. If they went to the movies, then they took the men and the kids and went to the movies. And the movies were about women, uh, mainly and their, their prob what was considered women's problems at the time, like whether to admit you were not a virgin when you got married, or whether to work after you got married, and stuff like that. Well, the studio loaned me to King Vidor to make our daily bread, and uh, it was not the kind of part I really was very interested in, because it was a goody-goody lead, and I was much more interested in playing um, women who died or killed people or had fierce problems and so on. But nevertheless, uh, it, was a, it was a lovely script and, and very interesting. And so we were going to shoot it in Tarzana. So I went out to Tarzana. There were four houses there. One belonged to uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs. It was his big house. Then there were three little houses. So I rented one of the little houses, uh, which uh, little house was three bedrooms and, an, and a maid room. And so I guess it was about a nine-room house. But anyway, that cost $135 a month. And we had moved out there for the duration of the shooting. It was a very uh, pleasant picture because King Vida was a very easygoing, friendly fella and never bossed anybody around and, and uh, had a very wonderful attitude toward films. He was a very musical person. His uh, films always, you can see, are similar to music. And uh, the, the climax of Daily Bread uh, was his idea, of course, and set to, mu to music by metronome. When we shot those scenes, there was a metronome going for us all the time. And there was one that didn't get in the movie, I was kind of sorry, where we we fed the workers by night. It was a beautiful uh, stuff, you know, with moonlight and fires and you know, the metronome going boom, boom. But that didn't get everything, not everything could get in the picture. But it was a very interesting uh, experience. And uh, uh, I was not, I had no idea what a co-op was and I didn't know whether it was a good idea or not. Uh, but I think that King, who was a, a conservative, person had an idea that people should just get together and help each other and uh, not depend on the government. And in this case, not to depend on big business either, which was doing rather poorly at the time. 
uh, but people have said, you know, how could it be that a person so conservative would take his own money? And he was notoriously um, cons conservative where money was concerned, take his own money and blow it on this picture. He didn't have a good release for it. He was in trouble. He had to borrow more money and he mortgaged his property and uh, he was passionate about it. Well, when you have a picture about the unemployed, uh, everybody has a story to tell, you know, and there was a lot of talk about unemployment and unemployment's no, <laughs> nothing new to actors, for God's sake. So there was a lot of talk about uh, um, ac uh, unemployment and what it does to people. Not very much talk about any way to solve it, I don't think. Gabriel over the White House was uh, the, God, the brainchild of William Randolph Hearst. And uh, he financed it, wanted it put on. He was in favor of Roosevelt at the time, felt that he was the savior of the country. And so he made this picture about a, a no good who gets a <laughs> knock in the head and becomes an angel and uh, is going to bring peace to the world by blowing up our navy, which uh, he does. It, it's extraordinary to think now that that picture could ever have been made. It's just so naive. And to think of, of Hearst as a naive person, you know, seems ludicrous, but there it was. Oh, I don't know, it was fine, I liked it. It was wonderful to be with, with Houston and, uh, and Francho was darling and uh, it was fun. Well, I think I liked Arsène Lupin the best. It had the two Barrymores in it, uh, John playing Arsène Lupin and Lionel playing the cop that's out to get him. And I'm a police spy and uh, uh, I get all dolled up and uh, we have a, a big romance. And uh, in the end, you know what happens. Lionel forgives him and we go off into the sunset. But it was fun and they were so darling and funny and, and Jack was on the wagon and it was just a lovely experience. I don't think I was any good in it, but I had a lot of fun. <laughs> it was, uh, it's just awful to, uh, well, I didn't decide to become an actress really. Uh, I decided to become a doctor but my family ran out of money and I had to leave college after only a year. And uh, I wasn't prepared for anything. I went to work in a department store and I knew that was not my future. So I, uh, I decided to take, my family would let me live at home for a year, you know, without contributing much. Uh, so I thought I'll take a year and give it a crack because I'd always been in all the school plays, you know, but that was just for fun. And uh, so I made the rounds and I, I did a few plays. There was some theater in LA at the time, of small parts and some plays and I did some radio and I went round and round from the studios. And at the end of the year, I hadn't got anywhere. So I sold my books and said, well, I'll give it six more months. And in about three months, I had a contract at Metro. But I had never planned. I wasn't good looking enough, and I didn't, I thought you had to be wonderful. And there were, but there was some very poor acting going on at the time. <laughs> that gave me courage. <laughs> once in a long time, once in a long time, somebody uh, is uh, discovered. Just somebody just thinks, gee, what a great face, or uh, what a lovely, person and said, do you want to be in the movies? But that's very, very rare. Most people slug it out. They work in the theater. They work any place they can. They become assistant stage managers and, uh, and make the rounds and do their best. And eventually they get a break. Well, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, I knew that the money would be good if I got a break. I mean, better than working in a department store. Uh, and, uh, and it was fun. Acting was always fun for me. And uh, I just thought I would take this wild chance. What can happen? What have I got to lose? Um, so, 
But I suppose having done it always, from the time I was a little kid, I was always in some kind of play or other, I suppose I had a, a stronger attraction to it than I realized. Well, I, had, I hadn't ever, you know, as I told you, planned to be an actress, but since I had always been in something or other, some church play or school play or the Girl Scout play or something or other, uh, by the time I, I finished high school, I had done a lot of stuff and also I'd taken a lot of courses. I took some more courses when I was in college and they all tended to be theatrical. Uh, but that was my idea of fun. I didn't dream of doing it seriously. Well, I'm probably the only, well, living now, certainly, but I mean, even 40 years ago, the only living person that broke a Metro contract. Uh, I resented the terrible paternalism. I just could not bear it. And uh, I just wanted to be freelance, and so... I told them I didn't believe it for two years, and uh, after two years of just loaning me out and not using me themselves, they thought I would change my mind. I, uh, I got out. I, mean, I know it sounds absurd. I'm sure if I had had any sense, I wouldn't have done it, but I was young and headstrong, and uh, I didn't like being bossed around. Yeah. Well, they, it was because Metro, I mean, the mayor thought he could tell me not to get married. And I didn't think that was any of his business. And he told me I ought to listen to my parents. And I finally got mad. And, and uh, I didn't tell him I was mad. It probably would have been better if we'd fought it out. But uh, I just sulked instead and decided I wanted out. No, but you didn't get uh, the good jobs. And uh, I didn't want to sign a contract with anybody else because it would have been the same thing all over again. So I just, uh, you know, I did, I, I could always work, but it wasn't um, the really good stuff. Uh, well, the treatment of Upton Sinclair was disgraceful. Uh, and uh, I think any intelligent person knew that the campaign against him was a fake and uh, that all these things they said about him were not true. And the people that they interviewed were uh, actors or something, I don't know, extras maybe. And, uh, but it was so unfair, it was, just, it was just lousy. But so many people were afraid of anything smacking of socialism that they, uh, they were frightened. And nobody knew what to do. The, the, uh, system had never fallen apart to that badly before. There had been bad times, but never on this worldwide scale. People were petrified. They didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, it was just a very fearful time. Easy to frighten people. No, I don't think actors were not very political, most of them. And uh, what they had to say was of no importance to anybody. No, I don't think actors were given a bad time about their politics. Their politics at that time were, are you a Democrat or a Republican? Uh, there uh, was later that the radical actors uh, appeared from New York. Well, uh, it was nice being a woman in Hollywood. Uh, unlike wives who were not working, had a very rough go, but uh, actresses had a very good time. And uh, you were invited in with the fellas, really. You know, you could uh, do almost anything if you wanted to see the rushes, you could. And, uh, and at, at parties, men talked to you when they didn't talk to their wives. And uh, as I said, it was the era when the big stars were women. Uh, there were a, f a few very big male stars, but most of them uh, were women, and the stories were about women. And uh, and a working actress had a very good time, I thought, on the whole. How many pictures I didn't get? <laughs> hundred, <laughs> a hundred. No, you very rarely got the ones you wanted the most. 
I wanted to play Imitation of Life, and I didn't get it, and oh, lots of things. No, well, not not really. Uh, I, I don't expect to have choice. Uh, I, you know, when you've only been there a couple of years, it would be absurd to accept, think that you're going to have a choice of scripts. I didn't, I didn't expect that. Well, the contract for player belongs to the studio. He's a piece of property, a valuable one, and if they're smart, well taken care of, but uh, you have very little power. And at the, for the first year, there's a, an option after six months, which the studio may or may not pick up. After that, there's an option once a year, which the studio may or may not pick up. You have nothing to say about that. Uh, if you don't like it, too bad. And uh, you have uh, no choice of parts, of course. You have to go to the publicity office when they tell you. Publicity department, you have to go to makeup when they tell you, you have to go to the hairdresser when they tell you, you have to go and have, be fitted and fitted and fitted and fitted. And if you happen to need to eat lunch, that's too bad, because many a lunch you ain't gonna eat. You, you will have something standing up, uh, and that's all. Uh, some people can um, adjust to this, and some people can't. Uh, I didn't mind being bossed around where work was concerned. I just didn't like being bossed around where my personal life was concerned. One thing they did uh, that's a wonderful uh, um, uh, training uh, is making tests for other people. When you're a young contract player and they want to see somebody in a scene, then you play the scene with them and it's photographed. Like I did Clark Gable's first um, test when he had teeth that looked like that and ears that were out to there. And uh, uh, lots and lots of people that later became a Metro um, contract players, you know, and an awful lot of people that never got anywhere. Um, but you played all kinds of scenes and all kinds of parts, and it, it, nobody would ever see them except the studio personnel. So it took uh, the nervousness out of acting, and it's an excellent, really, really great uh, uh, experience, and I don't think young people get that anymore. When the, the bad times came, my father said, you know socialism, he said, is a wonderful, wonderful dream. But if you took all the money there is and divided it equally among all the people, in about four years, it would be back in the same hands that it's in today. And when my mother was upset because a friend that I had known in school had a husband who could get only two days work uh, for, on a government project, and they had two kids and they were living on that. She said, if you really want to find work, you'll find it. Well, I don't think all people were, were quite that well-meaning and absurd, but an awful lot. Well, I never planned to be an actress. Uh, I had planned to be a doctor. and. Uh, I had been in all the school plays all my life, but um, my interest was to be a stalwart member of the community with a good income and respect and do good and so on, and medicine seemed to me the thing to do. But my family, my family ran out of money uh, when I was in college and I had to leave and go to work. And uh, I wasn't prepared for anything 